is we, we have standards for what counts as a book, because there's still a certain amount of production that goes into it. So a novel ranges officially between 100 to 175,000 words. Uh, mystery novels tend to be a bit shorter, 60 to 80. Uh, Sci-fi is really short, um, for whatever reason. But pretty much the average price of a book is $20. And the reason is, is because to produce the amount of, regardless of how many pages your book is, you still gotta run off a print, you still gotta bind the cover, you still gotta ship it somewhere. So there's a certain amount of base cost involved. So you can't charge below a certain price. The result is, is if I can't find a book for let's say $8, I want a certain bang for my buck for $8. You can't sell me a 20 page book for $8. I'm gonna be pissed, I want a certain amount of words. And I think this is where pretty much these, these word counts came from. It's all based on the cost of production. We can't charge less for this physical item. Um, a consumer won't pay that much unless they get a certain amount of content, so we're going to set these minimums. But it's actually all arbitrary. When we think of a book, we think of hundreds of pages, but why? Is there any reason? Only because industry has kind of forced it down our throats. Same thing with newsprint. Um, the first newspaper came along somewhere in the 8th century in China. Uh, it got modernized with the printing press around the 17th century. That's when the first newspapers started actually being sold. They were really standardized with the Industrial Revolution. And today you pay about a buck or two for a newspaper. And what's interesting is a newspaper tends to have at least two or three sections. It tends to cover a certain gamut of topics. Just think, you have your front section, you have your sports section, you have your business section. Why is a newspaper so broad? Well, because they're going to charge a buck or two for this newspaper. You want a certain bang for your buck. They have to appeal to as many markets as possible, so they go broad. But there's really no reason other than that. Uh, and we can see kind of the same thing happening in music. And I want to get down to the length of an album. We think of the length of an album within certain terms, but that's also kind of arbitrary. So, you know, the first... Uh, sorry. The phonograph, the record player, was invented in the late 19th century. Uh, magnetic tapes came along in the early 20th century, and the biggest popular formats that we've seen have been vinyl discs, 45s and, and LPs, cassette tapes and compact, di compact discs. So the vinyl record, first one came along, end of the 19th century, it really got standardized in what we know as an LP today around 1930, um, and there was two popular formats, the 12-inch vinyl and the 45. So you could fit about 45 to 50 minutes on vinyl, and you could fit about two to three songs per side on a 45. So all of a sudden the album got standardized as about 45 minutes long. If you were a signed artist, before they could mass produce you, before they can send you to market, you had to come up with 45 minutes of music. Not too much less and not too much more. And that in itself is kind of arbitrary. Um, magnetic tapes, when they came out, they were pretty much modeled on that. Um, the average magnetic tape ran about 60 minutes. It was an improvement on the vinyl record, and usually if you bought a factory tape, it was less than 60 minutes, but if you bought a blank, you could squeeze 60 minutes of music onto there. But the, by now, the entire record industry was working on an album format that was completely arbitrarily predetermined by technology from the 1930s, which was kind of silly. So at this point, industry is dictating how art is packaged and, and formatted. And then we got into the CD. Remember blank CDs? They held about 74 minutes, but if you bought an album, it was still about 50 minutes worth of music on there, even though the technology had outpaced these old industrial standards. So I guess what I'm getting at is books tend to range between 200 and 500 pages, and we pay about 20 bucks for them. Albums tend to run about 45 minutes, and we pay about 15 to 20 bucks for them. But th that price point is based entirely on the physical means of production. First of all, the album and book length are arbitrarily determined, and there's no reason they have to be that long, but the pricing is what I want to pick a bone with, because the pricing was based on physically producing a physical product, moving that physical product to various distribution points, paying for storage space to put this inventory in, moving that inventory to the shelf, paying for the retail space for, that, for it to sit there and go to market, and all the middlemen in between. So why in the hell, when I download an album from iTunes, am I still paying about $15 for the album, when really it's just a bunch of bits <coughs> sitting in the cloud that are being magically reproduced onto my computer? And the same thing goes for eBooks. I don't know if any of you know who Chuck Klosterman is. He's a funny writer. 
Um, his ebooks are, if you go download one of his ebooks from the Kindle store, it's pretty much the same price, and in some cases more, than buying the physical printed bound copy. Now that's ludicrous. There's no reason for it. Nothing is being bound. The editing has already been done. The formatting has already been done. They just took a digital file and dumped it into the cloud. Basically what I'm getting at is the means of content production, whether you're looking at music, whether you're looking at video, whether you're looking at memes, uh, print, it's all been liberated. Any one of us can go home and make crappy art or crappy content or crapping inbound marketing material as much as we want. Maybe it'll be good. But the means of distribution are also free. We don't have to move this stuff around anymore. It, there's nothing to be transported. There's nothing to be housed. No one has to pay rent to have a point of retail. Um, but even the means and the, of awareness and the means of commerce are completely free. If you are good at hustling, if you are charming, if you know how to use social media and search engines, you can move your product like nobody's business. But even if you choose to charge for your content, you can make a lot of money. You no longer need a publisher. Pretty much what publishers and record labels provide is a marketing service. If you know how to market yourself, you can completely cut them out of the picture. Because really, what value are they offering? Your album was recorded in a local studio, the production was done there. What you're looking for is distribution. Distribution to radio stations, distributions to record stores. When was the last time you walked into a record store, ladies and gentlemen? It hasn't happened in quite a long time. And I'm not blowing smoke out my ass here. If you think about it, we used to deal with printing presses and retail, points of retails and recording studios. But now I have the Kindle store and Smashwords and iTunes. I can record something, you know, in GarageBand and upload it to iTunes for sale. Anyone who podcasts know how easy it is to put content out there in the cloud. You don't believe me? This is the Kindle Million Club. These are 11 authors who have sold over a million copies uh, on the Kindle store. I want to talk about two of them. I want to talk about John Locke and Amanda Hawking. Why? John Locke was the first independent author to sell a million items, a million books on, on the Kindle store. No one had ever done it before on their own. Everyone else who had done it had already been backed by a publisher. They already had the marketing machine behind them. People already knew who they were. They already had print and bounded books. There was already a demand for their titles. So when they went to the Kindle, it was easy for them to move a million copies. John Locke, he never had a publisher. What did he do? He wrote short mystery novels and he sold them for 99 cents. And guess what? They tended to be shorter than the average 100,000 word novel. It tended to be a little bit shorter than 200 to 500 pages. Why? Because he didn't need that many pages to tell his story. And he was no, long, no longer conf uh, bound by you know, the physical means of production of having to move a physical product to market and charge a certain price. So he sold everything at 99 cents at a 35% commission from Kindle. By the way, if you price anything at 2.99 or more, you get a 70% commission. But when he sold a million copies, that was $346,000. He did that in less than two years, doing something he loved and producing length, uh, stories at a length that made sense to him. Because really, have you ever seen I Am Legend? Yeah? Okay. Thumbs up, thumbs down. Can I get a quick survey? All right, this is my opinion about the movie. Do you remember when the dog dies? Oh. Yeah, that's where the movie should have ended. I, I, thought, I thought the movie was pretty much wrapped up there, but then Hollywood is like, well, we're only at 45 minutes. We've got to get another 20, 30 minutes in there. So uh, let's have a strange woman and her child show up in town and save this guy's life after he's trying to commit suicide. And let's give him a hand grenade and let's have him save the day and let's have him escape and get to Vermont and be happily ever after. I think it would have been a beautiful piece of art. It just ended when the dog died, but they went further. And why did they go further? Because they actually have to distribute this movie to movie theaters. They actually have to charge people 10, 15 bucks to come into the door. I know what, because it costs so much to build these movie theaters, and no one is gonna pay 10, 15 dollars to watch a 45 minute movie. But you probably pay five. But let's forget about John Locke, let's move on, because he's not the only one to have done it. Amanda Hawking, you've probably heard of her. Um, she writes like really, well, I don't know, I've never read it, I just think the genre is bad, and you can hate me for saying it, but she writes, you know, uh, teen fantasy weird vampire romance stuff. Um, but she started self-publishing in April 2010. Um, by 2011, early 2011, she was moving 9,000 books a day. You find me one printed bound copy of any book that sold 9,000 copies a day. Um, she sold over a million. She made over two million dollars. 
Now, her pricing is all over the place. She didn't just go 99 cents. You look at the price of her books, it's like $7.63. I don't know where she came up with the formula, but her books range in length. Some are short, some are long. But she totally realized that there's no reason I have to charge $15, $20 a book. There's no reason I need a publisher. She has one now. I don't know why she even bothered. But this girl is like 24 and is a millionaire from a year of writing books and publishing them herself because she decided to say, screw it. So I guess what I'm going at is uh, I want to play with Karl Marx's favorite, famous you know, term, from each according to their ability to each according to their needs. It pretty much comes down to when you're producing content, whether you're going to do it, you know, uh, whether it's going to be audio, whether it's going to be print, whether it's going to be video, if you have the ability to produce good content, you have the ability to succeed. But pretty much it's, you've got to realize that you know, getting content out there is more than just producing good, great content. It's not just if you build it, it will come. A big part of it is having a marketing machine behind you. Now, maybe you don't have that talent. A lot of us don't. Um, not all of us are Amanda Hawking. I don't know what her magic sauce is. And a lot of us could benefit from having a record label or a publisher or something like that behind us. But we also have to start thinking the content we're kind of producing is there any reason why we have to have a 45 minute album or a 200 page book or a 120 minute film? There's no reason at all. We can go with any length we want because we've totally wiped out the physical means of production and distribution and we're not bound by those same kind of cost structures. So what's next? Um, a friend of mine, Julian Smith, he had this great post uh, on his blog and uh, he's a best selling author so he knows what the fuck he's talking about apparently. Uh, soon it's going to be great and free, and how in God's name do you get to compete against that? So basically what I'm saying, don't even try to sell your content. Give it away. And you're like, okay, how do I make money? Well, let me tell you how free works. It worked for Paulo Coelho. He wrote The Alchemist. He is like an award-winning, literally claimed author. He used to seed copies of his books on torrents, so he was kind of undermining his own publisher, just so he'd create the menu. Free work for Vice Magazine. Vice Magazine started off as an independent monthly newspaper produced in the Mile End neighborhood of Montreal, and is now in like 22 countries, is probably the only full gloss monthly magazine that continues to grow and has no problem selling advertising pages because it's free. By the way, their content is awesome too. And free also work for Angry Birds. Do you know how many hours of Angry Birds are played every day? It's like a million. It's retarded. And how's Angry Birds making money? Because they show you little ads when they play. And when my kid picks up my phone and starts playing Angry Birds on it, he accidentally clicks those ads, and I end up downloading another 99 cent app I didn't need, and Angry Birds made money because someone clicked an ad and they got a commission off of that. So, if you think I'm crazy, I want you to tell me so. Uh, if you have any questions, I want you to ask them to me. Preferably later tonight, if you come across me in the ram, I want you to buy me a drink. <laughs> Out of the kindness of your heart. But pretty much what I'm saying is, I think the opportunity is to give stuff away. To give great stuff away, and it will lead to other opportunities. If you give great, great e-books and you give them away, sooner or later, um, maybe a movie studio comes along and says, we want the film rights to this. Because did you know 80% of movies are actually based on a book at some point that they bought the rights to? Same thing with music. If you're a musician, give your great music away. Suddenly people will pay you to you know, go on Man's Warped Tour or show up at Coachella or something like that. And the same thing can go for just about any other kinds of content. Produce great content, give it away, and it will lead to other opportunities. Because I think our job as a content producer is not to sell our content, it's to produce great content and find other ways around it. And if you doubt it, look at all the successful blogs out there. They blog for free because they have an audience people pay to advertise alongside them. So there's a lot of different ways you can do this. Uh, it can come down to licensing your content later, it can come down to being ad supported. But frankly, I, I think the whole economic model of charging for content is completely broken and obsolete and it's time to do away with it. Questions? Are there any successful uh, models that, that charge? People are still charging for books. Like John Locke is still charging 99 cents a book, and Amanda Hawking is still selling books. Um, I think the trick right now is people are still used to paying for content. Uh, and I know people who sell ebooks uh, and or sell their own stuff on iTunes and, and they're making money. I just, I'm predicting the market's going to get to a point where we can steal all this content for free anyway. We've got to stop charging for it because. 
I don't think where that's the money is. So yeah, there, there are plenty of successful models out there. But if you notice uh, the, the new success stories that keep coming up, they're charging less and less. And I think it's because people intuitively understand, like there's no reason I have to pay for this because there's no longer that fiscal plan structure.